Chapter 19 of The House on the Downs by Gladys Edson Locke. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Lengthening Shadows. Mark, having given suitable excuses to Sir Quentin, lingered outside the schoolhouse to speak with Irene. Didn't I tell you you'd be vindicated? he cried by way of greeting. By George, I'll make those newspaper asses retract their insinuations. The actress, Manageress, shook her head. It will be best to let the whole wretched business die a natural death. I am very, very sorry for Lady Eve Rotherdean. So am I, and for Sir Quentin, too. Dear old chap, he's hit hard by it all. Miss Grail sighed. It's bad for everyone concerned. Well, Mark, I must be getting back to Brighton, or I shall be late at the theatre. You don't mean you're going to act tonight? I must, dear old boy. My understudy is impossible in the part. Besides, it will take my mind off this miserable affair. I'm going to Brighton with you, then, Mark announced. We'll just slip away from the members of your company and go in a taxi by ourselves. There's things I want to say to you. Irene smiled, flushing a little under the warmth of his gaze. I suppose you are determined to have your way in this? Absolutely, he declared. You'll have to put up with me for a few hours. In the meantime, Sir Quentin and his party were motoring back to the Grange. Alwyn Rotherdean chose to return, as he had come, alone and on foot. Arrived at the Grange, Sir Quentin followed Eve upstairs into her boudoir and closed the door. "'I want you,' he commenced, without preamble, "'to be ready to go to Lewis with me tomorrow morning. We shall be married again and have everything in order this time.' "'Married again?' Eve gave a forced little laugh. "'Why are you proposing to do this, Quentin? Out of a sense of duty or morality?' "'At present it seems that legally we are not married at all,' he pointed out. "'We can hardly go on this way.' No, she agreed, we hardly can. Do you realize, Quentin, that you neither spoke nor as much as glanced at me the entire way from the village, and your tone now is distinctly that of a schoolmaster? You are treating me as though I were a naughty child, and I resent it. Perhaps you will permit me the relief of a cigarette? She drew a cigarette from a gold case on the dressing table, lighted it, and removing her hat, sank gracefully into the luxurious depths of a gilt armchair. Leaning back with indolent ease, she blew out tiny blue smoke rings. Sir Quentin regarded her gravely. Why were you not honest with me, Eve? Honest with you? She flecked a bit of ash from the skirt of her gown. I believed myself a widow when I married you. I know that, he acknowledged. But I mean later, when you learned that your husband was alive. I suppose I was afraid to, she admitted frankly. Have I ever given you cause to be afraid to come to me in difficulties, Eve? Couldn't you trust my love? Couldn't you believe that I would try to do the right thing? Oh, the right thing, no doubt. She gave an impatient little twitch to her shoulder. That is precisely what I was afraid of. What do you mean, Eve? Her eyes, as deeply blue as the sea, stared up at him half mockingly. Well, you know, Quentin, you are quite hopelessly Victorian in your views on life. Craddock Rayner was my husband, and you were not. I thought it possible you might consider it righteous for me to return to him, and I detested him. A divorce could have been arranged, Eve, and then we could have remarried. Eve tapped the ash from her cigarette. What an amazingly modern proposition for you to set forth, Quentin. I confess I should never have believed you capable of it. His grave face grew graver still. It would have been the lesser of the two evils. Oh, well, she said lightly, it would have made a county scandal. I hope to avert that, for your sake especially, and should have, if things hadn't got bungled up. They were quite likely to get bungled up, Eve, with blackmail and adultery involved. She blew another little ring of smoke upward. I dislike moralizing, Quentin. I did what seemed to me the best thing. Of course, I'm frightfully sorry it turned out so badly. It's very hard on you, I know. Never mind that part of it, he said more kindly. It is of you we must think. Now there is one thing I must ask of you, Eve. I want you to discourage Mostyn's attentions. And if I shouldn't choose to, what then? Thinly veiled insolence in her eyes. You must choose to, his tone final. Tomorrow morning, as I said, we will go over to Lewis. She viewed Sir Quentin with mocking serenity. I don't suppose it occurs to you that I may not be palpitatingly eager to accept the honor you magnanimously offer me? Don't be childish, Eve he said impatiently. Of course I regard you as my wife, 
as I always have. But the world does not, and we shall have to go through the ceremony again. I prefer it to be as soon as possible. Tomorrow morning. Eve shrugged. Possibly I shall not feel in the mood for Lewis tomorrow morning. I shall expect you to feel in the mood. She withdrew her cigarette and smiled. No one has ever been successful in attempting to discipline me, Quentin. We will see what the morning brings forth before we quarrel over going to Lewis. Can't you realize, he said, striving to be patient, that all this means far more to you than it does to me? Eve gave again a forced little laugh. You are positively medieval, after all, my dear Quentin. Don't you know that in this glorious, untrammeled twentieth century, a woman as well as a man may wander among the primroses and not be too badly thought of? You are talking for the sake of talking, he answered, determined to be forbearing. Of course you are tired and overwrought. You want sleep, Eve, my dear. I'm no end sorry if I seem harsh and dictatorial. I don't mean to be. To tell the truth, I'm a bit bowled over by all this. She looked at him curiously. Suppose in the morning I should decline to go through a marriage ceremony with you. You couldn't, he declared with conviction. Don't you see we've got to? No, she averred recklessly. I don't see that we've got to do anything we don't want to do. That is childish, Eve. Well, my dear, I'm not going to argue the matter. A night's rest will make you see everything in its proper light. And if it doesn't, she mocked, there will be Fizenta to console you. I don't think, Eve, he rebuked, that flippancy is in order now, and there is a question I want to ask you about Fizenta. Did she tell the truth in the witness box today, or was she lying to shield you? Eve leisurely laid aside her cigarette. You don't fancy that I know anything about Fizenta's affairs, do you? If she did any romancing in the witness box, I dare say she had her own good reasons for doing so. And now, Quentin, there is a question I should like to ask you. Do you believe that I killed Craddock Rayner? Sir Quentin studied her lovely face a moment. I hope not, he said earnestly. Eve gave a hard little smile. You have an amazing trust in me, haven't you? I think I shall lie down now. I had rather you didn't stay. I shall try to sleep as you advise. Cicely Carswell will be my maid tonight. If Melson presumes to come here, she will find the door locked. Cynthia shall not come, Sir Quentin assured her. I shall tell her tonight that she must leave here tomorrow, and I shall settle an annuity upon her for her good old father's sake. Now don't worry, Eve, my dear. Everything is coming out right. Perhaps, said Eve indifferently. As the door of the boudoir closed behind Sir Quentin, Eve reached for the telephone on the ebony inlaid stand by her chair. Sir Quentin sought out Fazenta Lee, whom he finally found on the western terrace, which fronted the downs. The Romany was gazing toward the bold heights, and something of the radiance of the setting sun was gathered on her features as she turned to Sir Quentin. How I love them, my downs, she exclaimed in a low, impassioned voice. The baronet smiled understandingly. I share your love for our Sussex hills, gypsy maid. Ah, that's what I am, just a wild gypsy yet, for all your goodness and training. I wouldn't have you different, Fizenta Lee. There's gypsy blood in us Rotherdeens, only four generations back, and I know a bit how you feel. If the Romany wanderlust calls you irresistibly tonight, put on your gypsy dress and roam the downs. I know you will come back to your guardian that was, and I'm still hoping that Rodney will come back too. He must, he will. Whatever else we gypsies are, we are grateful, and we love our friends. But Rodney wants talking to. He is impulsive, and he takes things too seriously. What things, Fazenta? Oh, everything. Sir Quentin's troubled eyes studied her face. You mean Eve? Fazenta gave him a look from under her long, dark lashes. I don't know why you should say that. Oh, yes, you do, Fazenta. In your loyalty, you try to keep many things hidden that you think might distress me. But I see more than you think. In the witness box today, you lied valiantly to protect Eve. Why did you do it? She has not always been kind to you. Fazenta was silent. Why did you do it? he repeated. You love her, she said simply. It was the least I could do to repay you for all your goodness to me. I have idolized Eve, he admitted brokenly. But now, God help us both, I don't know how I feel toward her. Fazenta's eyes, as she raised them to his, were liquid and full of light. It's just the shock of today's disclosures. Your love will come back. Love cannot die. Sir Quentin looked at her intently. 
You speak as though you knew what love is, Fazenta. A crimson tide swept up over the Romany's cheek and brow. I think I know what love might be. Sir Quentin's scrutiny was very kindly, very affectionate. You deserve the best, Fazenta, but I'm dashed if I know how I could do without you. The little gypsy girl has grown into my heart amazingly. As long as you want me, I shall always be here, dear guardian that was. I shall always want you, Fazenta, but I hope I'm not selfish enough to try to keep you from greater happiness. There is no greater happiness for me, she said softly. She looked again on the darkening hills. See how the shadows are lengthening. Soon it will be night out there on the downs, with the stars and the moon and the sweet scent of flowers and the salt air from the sea. Sir Quentin regarded her sympathetically. Fazenta, dear girl, if the Romany spirit calls you out on the downs, your downs, go to them. No, she said determinately, I'm going to conquer this roving fever. I won't worry you as Rodney is doing. Bless you, Fazenta. You're the greatest comfort I have. The Romany was silent, watching the lengthening shadows. Suddenly she gave a little shiver. How close the shadows are creeping. Soon they will settle upon the grange. It may be only gypsy superstition, but I feel as though tragedy was creeping on those shadows. Nonsense, rallied Sir Quentin. We've had the tragedy, and now, please God, we're coming out into the sunshine. I'd like to think so, Fazenta responded soberly. But you know, as we all do, that for many weeks past there has been something wrong at the Grange, some evil power abroad at night. I can't help feeling it will culminate in another tragedy. You mustn't allow yourself to become morbid, he admonished, although his face reflected the gravity of hers. I'll admit I can't delude myself any longer into thinking these queer happenings are pure accident, but we'll not get too gloomy about it. I'm going to have a thorough investigation made. In fact, there is a detective working on the matter already, and I mean to have an architect, in addition, to sound the entire house for secret passages. You have heard, then, those footsteps in the wall going up and up? Well, I fancied I have, but you mustn't get brooding about it, Fazenta. We shall soon know whether it is anything more than imagination run riot, and then I'm going to take you and Eve for a little holiday on the Normandy coast. Ah, Mrs. Carswell, what is the matter, eh? The frail little figure of the housekeeper was coming precipitately toward them. It's the east wing again, Sir Quentin. There's a light moving on the upper floor. My niece, Cicely, saw it from the kitchen garden. End of chapter 19